There we go. Well, as I said, I want to welcome everybody once again to another exciting edition of Music Scene Investigation. Rich Wildman here with you. Glad to have you along with us. And uh, this week is like every other week. We're going to have some great music to listen to, some great reviews to uh, to hear, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Thanks for showing up, everyone out in the uh, everyone out in the chat room. If you want to uh, watch us live as we produce MSI, you can always go to msi.icweekly.net, musicsceneinvestigation.com, and join us in the chat room. We'd love to see you. You can always download recordings of this uh, video, this show, if you miss it, off iTunes and all other fine podcast directories across the internet and you can watch us on justin tv as well so uh without uh, further ado let's meet our panelist today from uh new york city our uh, esteemed recording engineer tom chianti is with us once again tom how are you today sir fine thank you for asking rich it, uh we lost our uh, summer and uh, went back into a little bit of winter, and it's been a little cold and uh, dreary around here. But um, it's other in the, it's than in that, the mid eighties down here. Well, that's where you are. I'm just surprised it's so cold up there. Well, this is the way it's supposed to be. You know, it doesn't start really uh, warming up till the end of April, beginning of May. Okay, I got and, you. You know, um, we just had like an extended, uh, I don't know, somebody dropped spring in the middle of winter. <laughs> At least you're getting spring. We went straight to summer down here. So uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, well, you only have two seasons, right? Day and night. Pretty much, pretty much. Thanks for being with us today, Tom. As always, I appreciate it. In uh, London, England, our very own Ian Husbands is also with us, a producer extraordinaire as well as a good musician, too. Don't let him tell you otherwise. Ian, how are you? Oh, I'm all right, Rich, and thank you very much for the comments. It's very kind of you. The, even the bad ones, huh? Well, you know, you've got a give and take in a relationship, and uh, I like to give and you like to take. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'd like to remind everyone while we're here uh, that, that you can also now get the show on our new mobile um, app. That's Can't true. You, Rich? That is very true. I would forgot to mention that. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go to uh, musicsceneinvestigation.com on your mobile device, whether it's an iPhone, uh, an Android phone, an iPad tablet, you'll be redirected to the mobile site. Now, on the mobile site, you can do virtually everything that you can do on the regular website. The only thing you can't do is watch the live video and submit music but the good thing is you can listen to the live audio of the show uh, on MSI radio which we rebroadcast everything on uh, as well and you can listen to live music scene investigation radio 24 7 anywhere you happen to be across the world it's a great great thing so thanks for reminding me about that Ian that's all right someone's got to keep you on the board eh, Rich? Well, I appreciate it too so uh, how you been what have you been up to yeah, I've been good. Yeah, um, I, I had a bit of a drunken night Friday writing music, which is always pleasant, uh, with my mate Andy, who's in the band with us. And uh, so, yeah, it's been a generally a chilled out, relaxed weekend and uh, ready to listen to some music now. Well, good, good. We're ready to bring music to everyone as well. But before we do that, we want to introduce our guest panelist this week. No stranger to music scene investi investigation. In fact, he's a very good friend of ours. At least I like to think so. Uh, we've uh, known him for about, what, about a year now, I guess. Uh, it, Mr. Paul Miro is back with us once again. Paul, how are you, sir? Glad to have you back. I'm fine and dandy. Great to see you all again. How are you all doing? We're doing real well. It's a little hot, like I was saying, uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's Alabama in the springtime, so... I've heard these things. I just find it really strange that a country that gets so hot has so many guns. You know, it's really weird. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I mean, I want to, I want to kill my neighbors, and it's only eight degrees here. You know. Well, I, I tell you, come to Alabama. You too can have a gun. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my way. In fact, I'm on my actually, way. just say you're from Alabama, and they'll send you one. Will that work over here? I, I don't yeah, know I'd... if it'll work there. Okay. I, I don't okay. know. Now. Uh, you were on the show here, uh, gosh, it's been probably about a month, month and a half ago, and um, 
what's been going on since that time? I know you've been hard at work. You're still in studio. Yeah. Uh, you spend yeah. more time in the studio than any man I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's very, very true. Um, and this month's been ridiculous. Before that, I was doing some work with um, Simon Friend from The Levelers. I've been doing a few shows with him. Um, he's got a side project called Seismic Survey, which uh, has been really fun. We played a few festivals and a few kind of uh, private shows to about 500 to 1,000 people, which has been really, really good. And we've got a few more of those going on in the summer and uh, about 10 shows in December with that. But my priority has been, I decided, because I, 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 as a solo artist, there's this problem of being independent where you're there all the time wanting to get your own music out, but obviously having to take on other work and prioritize. And I wanted to get... Um, my third solo album out this year that's been on my kind of mental background calendar for so long so what I decided to do a month ago was just cancel everything else I've just not done anything but locked myself away in the studio this last month to start completing all of the uh, the ideas in production for my next album and um, the problem is uh, it's great having your own studio and I do have a clock in it but the problem is I've been kind of pulling 18 20 hour days for the last 28 days and um i'm gonna have a night off after this i'm telling you <laughs> everybody deserves a night off uh now when you go in studio when you lock yourself in studio is that something mm -hmm. that uh that you do often would you recommend that musicians do that I don't recommend any musician does anything that's outside of their comfort zone. I mean, I've worked um, in bands all of my life. I'm an oddity. I'm an anomaly. I'm not um, from the point of rock and roll. I'll do that. I do that lifestyle, but I get up early in the morning. I don't get hangovers um, and, and I'm enormous control freak from the point of production. And, um, <laughs> I've just always had this. I put it down to my parents. I blame them. There was always this thing that if you were in bed after 7 a.m., um, you used to get a, a cup of coffee, slam down next to the bed, and, <laughs> and be made to feel like you were really, really guilty. And I still think um, I carry that kind of... It's been conditioned into me to be up whatever you've done the night before. But no, my thing is, I'm a creative. So however much I apply the discipline of production and recording and going through the rules and regulations of getting things right, I can't stop the voices in the head. So once they start, I'm awake. There's nothing I can do about that. Chronic insomniac. I don't need much sleep, thankfully, which is great. Uh, I'll get by on four hours. And... When I wake in the morning, I've usually got a flood of ideas. I'll sit, I'll make notes, I'll get some breakfast, I'll go for a run before that, and then I'll get in the studio with a pot of coffee, take regular breaks, um, you know, every 10 minutes, every couple of hours for a cigarette and a bite to eat or whatever, and more coffee. Uh, I just don't have a problem with concentration. I've worked with so many people who've got, you know, some people don't start till five. Some people work best in the evenings. You've got a lot of guys who can't get out of bed till three in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You've got some people who can only work for four hours in a day. They're only creative for that period of time. The one thing I would say is uh, don't work past when it's being creative. We've all done that. Um, I don't do that anymore. I, I know when something's not working. You know, it, when the mind's gone numb, it's a point of saying, you know, what's the point in flogging this? Let's come back to it in the morning. Because guaranteed, when you are there overthinking and nothing's happening, that's the time to call it a day, go back to it the next day, and virtually guaranteed you'll come up with something in 10 minutes that might have taken you six hours had you tried to pull an all-nighter. So don't overdo it. Uh, run to your own limits and don't use anyone else as an example. That's the way I look at it. That makes perfect sense. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, I, I want to ask a question. Sure. As one yeah. coffee lover to another, yeah. what coffee fuels these sessions? Well, I go, I get this imported stuff um, from a place called the Coffee Shack, and they do. Being a diabetic, I uh, I can't do all the the, um, the added liquidy flavorings. Um, but this woman, she marinates all the beans. Uh, they're all marinated in um, uh, non-sugar. Uh, 
uh, resins and whatever. And I've got all kinds of amazing flavors, tiramisu and um, cinnamon and hazelnut and really strong javas, lovely mockers, all that kind of thing. I just put them in my grinder, put them in the machine and let them filter away. And um, I'm like Balzac on coffee. I, I probably drink 15 cups of coffee a day, I'd say. Same applies. Fantastic. There you go. Coffee shack. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I shall, I'll give you the uh, info after the show, Sean. Well, it's very important for musicians to know what coffee they're drinking. <laughs> oh, completely, completely. I just would not ever have worked without coffee. I'm, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely swear by it. I swear Fantastic. by coffee also, but as long as it <coughs> smells like coffee, looks like coffee, tastes like any type of coffee, I'll drink it. So, Paul, right. tell, us, uh, tell us a bit about your new album, if you can. I know you're still working on it, but what can you tell yeah. us about it? Well, it's got a rockier edge than the last two albums I've released, which have been kind of, I guess, what you'd call more singer-songwriting. Now, my my thing is, is I do write in a variety of, si- of styles, and... Um, I'd got three albums in development. My thing was I wanted to have three consistent albums, if that makes sense. I was going to do an acoustic album, a more hip-hoppy, loopy album, and a more straightforward, um, up-tempo, rock song-ish album. And what's happened is I sat down um, with a bunch of tracks that I'd already got in production that were not a part of those three projects whatsoever. They were just a kind of, right, when I get, uh, when I get my band on the road i want to write some songs for that and essentially what's happened is these songs just felt me that left me feeling pretty excited and i thought i'm going to pursue this lot so i've got if you like a solo album that sounds like a band it's quite um it's quite edgy it's a little bit sleazy uh big hooky choruses um really really fun um i'm really enjoying it Uh, it's very very heavily produced from the point of textures um, hundreds and hundreds of backing vocals just purely because uh, I love backing vocals loads of guitars um, loads of riffs loads of melodies and um, obviously I should be sending you copies for um, your oral inspection as soon as it's complete yeah and I, I'm sure that uh, Tom Andy Ian, and myself would love to hear it. there's no doubt about that but I, I'm especially sure that uh, those two guys Tom and Ian would love to go over them and put them under the microscope so to say sure yeah. Well, we've done a we've done a uh, review for the Pac Man when you released that little EP, didn't we as well? So you did. Well, one of the again. tracks, yeah, one of the tracks on the album is one that I originally did for the Pac Man, but it's 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 me who was yeah. So it's me minus any other Pac Man. <laughs> so no so. more Pac Man. <sighs> Just yeah, I, well, hey, you know, maybe at some point it's just it it was not it was not a credible option with Alex on my schedules. It was just getting beyond a joke of having tracks lying around that you were hoping two people were going to have input on uh, that I'd written and produced, and I was just kind of awaiting Alex to be available. And it just it just hasn't worked at this stage. I mean, I know you, you keep seeing all these things. Ironically, Skype, I had a Skype thing um, this week saying, hey, watch this band play live in the UK and LA simultaneously. It's the only way it's possible. Well, it is if um, the other guys in the band don't have the same schedule as you, because otherwise uh, getting that video of you all playing together is um, traumatic enough, you know. Yeah. And now, uh, on on your new album, uh, you're saying you're hoping for, what, a summer release on it you're looking at? Planning, yeah. um, I'm hoping end of June, but it's all down to um, uh, what I I need to get press campaign ready before that. I'm talking with people at the minute with that in mind. Um, Obviously, I need to get everything coordinated. If it's later, then it'll be later. But, yeah, I'm hoping for a summer release. All right. Well, we're definitely looking forward to seeing something from you, hopefully in in early summer then. I think that will be great. Now, uh, gentlemen, we're here for a job. The job is reviewing music sent to us by musicians from around the world, of course. And uh, these musicians can send them in from our website. Uh, Hit the Submit a Song link at the top of the page. That's the easiest way to do it. We've selected three today, guys. Are you ready for the first one? I am. Let's listen. All right, I knew you guys would be. Here it is, song number one on today's MSI.
There you have song number one on today's MSI. Let's go over to Ian and find out what he thought about it. Ian, your thoughts on uh, song number one? I like the song, but this sounds to me like it's been recorded live in sort of one take or something like that because the biggest thing that lets this down is, is the production and the performances. I mean, there's some really nice parts being played. As a, as a written song, it stands up very, very well. I like the tempo change into that chorusy bit. Um, but it's, it's the performances that let this down and the recording. 
Um, it's very, very raw, which kind of works for this sort of music. It's that 70s folk sort of style thing. Great, be great at Woodstock or something like that. Um, but it's just too raw. There's no compression on things. It's all just sitting there, which is what makes me think it's been done live, really. And um, you know, the mandolin, I mean, I know Paul's our resident mandolin expert, but um, it was very, very loose. The acoustic was a bit sloppy. The drums were fading in and out of the, of the time. Uh, the, there was no clarity in the bass. And you could hear noise gates kicking in when the vocals came in as well. Um, I really like the song. I really do like it. I think the song's got a huge potential. But it needs re-recording, um, properly laid down tracks, um, do the overdubs, get the performances nice and tight and don't stop until they're, they're spot on because it needs it. It's a good song. All right, got you, Ian. Thank you very much. Let's go to Tom, find out what he thought. Tom? I tried to like it, but it was very distracting with the background singer. It was, you know, like uh, I agree with Ian. It was very, very loose. It, it, it sounds like a, a homegrown uh, recording, which is, is not too bad, but it, it could have been done much better. Um, it may have been a first take and, and whatever. The song structure, there was a, um, a, a, a solo and a, another interlude. You know, you could have done it. It was too long. It's definitely could. Hello, hello. Sorry, that's me. I'm going to put that on mute for a second. Um, it was uh, too long. It it, it it could have done a lot with uh, not having the musical interlude going right back interlude going right back into the verse. Um, musical outro went too long. I know they were going for an anthem type of feel, and um, overall, it's 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 got some good pieces there. But uh, I agree with Ian. It it really needs. They got to practice. Um, they got to get it tighter and um, have somebody who knows what they're doing record it. Um, and then, you know, make sure that the, the background is, you know, following the lead and, and, and singing the same song. All right. Well, that makes sense, Tom. I appreciate that. Thank you. And now to our guest panelist, Mr. Paul Miro. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with um, Ian and Tom. I mean, it's, it's obviously self-evident that that was, it's either been recorded on, um, kind of auto four track recorder or in the rehearsal room or whatever and things uh, I always say make your demos cheap and cheerful if you want producers or whatever but that's kind of taking it a little bit too far there are stripping it down to simplistic terms the song has got some potential nice melodies I like the idea of the it's, it's kind of like that Fleet Fox's vibe of male and female thing that's going on with a lot of um, of US um, country folk things at the minute it could be made to sound very current at the moment it's very very messy um, from a production point so I don't even think we we need to talk about that um, because it is it's a it's a rehearsal room recording but if that's the way that these guys are operating and they're looking to get feedback from those sort of things they should either uh, invite people to the rehearsal room where even in that format it would be more impressive than recorded or b find someone like tommy says who does record who records to a higher level i'm not talking about finding a top end producer or anything but someone who will um, ensure that the instruments are in tune, that they're mic'd properly, and who they respect from a point of arrangements, um, who can shave a minute off. I mean, that, that song was a minute and a half too long. The solo dragged on for days. And again, in that state, if you're trying to get someone to pay attention to it, um, I, I drifted whilst carried with the vibe of what everyone's saying. There is, it's a great idea of a song and it's the anthemic thing that's going to build and then it falls into that intimate section where you got the two vocals and not a lot's going on and I like I quite like the mandolin idea of even that top line giving it a sort of faces-y sort of feel that's all good but record it 
to a point where everything's balanced and where the song is what people are going to be impressed with from an arrangement point of view. Chop it down and make it count and just get something that's recorded a little bit better, you know. All right, yeah, I appreciate that, uh, Paul. Now, uh, some of the guys in the chat room have uh, said their piece on this. Uh, One of the uh, things that Randolph said that I uh, noticed was he'd clap at an open mic night, but anywhere else that's just a little bit too sloppy for his likes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of, yeah, what I'm saying about if you were in the rehearsal room listening to that, you'd go, yeah, that's okay. But to record it, um, it's kind of like uh, you you don't want to be perhaps recording all your rehearsals and sending them out to people you need. In this uh, era where recording things to um, a better level is not a problem, you can't be sending out things that haven't had a bit of attention paid to uh, levels and a bit of attention paid to arrangement. That's the it. other thing is they should pay more attention to each other. That would sure, yeah. things up. You yeah. know, they were I all... think, though, I, I agree. I totally agree, Tommy. But, I mean, I'm, I'm not disputing what you're saying. What I'm thinking, though, is they've obviously lived with that track for a while. And if they are in a position where, you know, like musicians get into a situation, I mean, or everyone's been in bands and you allow people their space and there gets to be this point where you have this orchestra in the mind where everything's sounding fantastic that you're doing and what everyone else does is ancillary. So talking about it amongst yourselves, sometimes you do need an external body to kind of say, Guys, you know, um, you've got the potential here to have a really nice cake, but at the moment it's a poo sandwich and we need for you to play this and you to do this and you to do that, that everyone respects without there being any kind of internal band vibes. Now, I get the the idea that these guys are um, hippies, which is no disrespect to them. I think they're kind of pretty chilled people, else they wouldn't be making this sort of music. And I don't think they're going to be, again, I'm kind of just interpreting this, just getting a feel that they won't be the kind of people to sit down and go, did you know, like, that bass line, maybe, maybe instead of playing it for 32 bars, maybe if we did it for eight, um, because they'd be afraid of upsetting the bass player. So if someone else did it, <laughs> them, I think it would work better. Hmm. All right. I think the because, ultimate, uh, the, ulti- the ultimate thing here is more practice, rehearse as a band, get that tighter, definitely. and that would be tighter, make but that not a lot too better. tight, ironically, because that lo-fi, slight sloppiness. You know, they don't want to go to the end of becoming super slick session sounding. I kind of like the uh, there's an element of sleaziness about it, not sleaze of, of ah, lo-finess is that. I think if it's recorded right and everyone's on it, I think it'll, it could work really well. I Please, just man. want to know, Paul, is there a B-side to a booth poo sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the album comes with free wipes. Oh, goodness. And on that note, <laughs> and on that note, let's uh, introduce you to that track. That track is called... Been One of Those Days by Hard Rock and Rob. So Hard Rock and Rob with Been One of Those Days. Thanks for sending that in to uh, Music Scene Investigation. We really appreciate that. Now, gentlemen, we got two more songs to do. Before we get to the second song, however, I want to remind everybody about our friends over at Butterflies Radio. Butterflies Radio every Tuesday night with Twitter Tuesday Live. They have uh, your favorite indie artist on doing uh, in-depth interviews with them over the course of two hours. You can learn anything and everything you want to know about your favorite indie artist over at ButterfliesRadio.com with Mark and Carol. So please tune in to them on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. All right, guys, uh, we've got uh, our second song up right now. So uh, put your headphones on and turn the music up. And here we go with song number two on today's MSI. Home 
Song number two on MSI, and uh, let's go over to Tom, find out what he thought about it. Tom, what's your thoughts on song number two? Turn down the chorus. The uh, <laughs> chorus guitars and the harmonies are beating against each other. It's like beating your head against the wall. Everything sounded out of tune. It's recorded much better than the first one. But uh, they got to get a hand on the effects. They, um, I did like the lead guitar sound, though. Um, that's probably because it was, uh, you know, not chorusy and tons of delay on it. It was pretty straightforward. The song didn't really hit me. Um, a little um, a sense of theme here. Of, uh, down country western going on um and i'm not liking it i'm telling you rich i'm not liking it at all <laughs> well i gotta tell you tom it's uh through no fault of my own the random picks are the random picks you get what you get uh paul what do you think of uh song number two uh very country like well, tommy's saying and um the kind of country that perhaps i don't do, do um out of choice um, <laughs> but <laughs> if we if we stick to uh, constructive 
things here. Um, I think I'm always trying to say about demos and presenting them, and everyone everyone has this thing of, oh, right, I, I really need to present it so everyone thinks like I've produced the best thing ever. Um, right, lesson one, you've got a crappy drum machine. That's all anyone's going to hear. So they know that whatever else you layer on top of it is unnecessary. My thing with that song would be, um, if you if you want people to listen to it and pay attention, kill all the backing vocals. Just a one backing vocal because you know there's lots of layering going on there, and about twenty thousand guitars. The steel stuff that was going on really well played. My impression of this is, I think it's a guy who's a singer songwriter who plays guitar and sings, and he's done it all himself, and. The drums are kind of like, yeah, I don't really know much about them, but the guitars are going to sound awesome. And um, lots of vocals are on there uh, that are, I don't know, they make it sound more and more like a demo. They don't make it sound any more well-produced. And what happens is it ends up sounding like, I don't know, lift music. And there was something about with the drum machine going on and what sounded like programmed bass as well that... I couldn't get out of my head that I thought there was going to be some kind of like um, Jack Black line, a comedy line in there somehow. And I know that that's not what the guy intends whatsoever. So I'm giving a total um, instant punter reaction to that of saying that it was counterproductive. Didn't get the tune that much. I didn't really think there was a chorus. There was a reprise thing about 10,000 guitars, but I don't know whether he was just telling me that's how many he'd used in the recording. Um, but on the whole, I thought it was inoffensive. It just didn't shake my tree. And I think if he, if he is going to be putting out stuff that he's doing himself or for people like us to listen to, then simplify it. Just keep, you know, keep the, the, the pedal sounding stuff. That's awesome. And keep the melodies, but don't overstack the BVs because there's no need for that to be done when it is so obviously a, a home recording, if that makes any sense. Makes perfect sense to me. Ian, uh, make perfect sense to you? Basically, Paul's just nicked my whole review. Um, I get yeah, it. I, I mean... downloaded them earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's doing this on the fly, remember? Um, yeah. The drum programming was was stale and and boring to say the least, and the drums sounded unreal uh, and very very midi. So to start with, that was my biggest bugbear because as Paul says, that is all you heard really throughout the track. Mm. Uh, loved the guitar. The, the, some of the guitar work was fantastic. Liked the sound and the tone. I did feel it had a bit too much reverb on in places, but you know, that's fine. Uh, the voice to me was a sort of poor imitation of Dylan or Petty or something like that, and I didn't think he carried it off because it didn't have the character of Dylan or Petty. There was it was just very monotone and very on a level, and there was no real fluctuation in the melody. There was no real passion to it, and as Paul was saying, the whole stacking of backing vocals, just harmony layers as well. There was no real backing vocal going on as such. Um, was too much you you know i use backing vocals to add dimensions to the song they're there to add color to the song in places you want to add color to it to lift into a chorus so you know if you're going to strip some harmonies out strip them out and on the verses bring them in on the chorus to show it all the reprises ball called it it wasn't really a chorus but you know to, to bring a dynamic to the track that isn't there at the moment the whole thing sort of stayed on one level once it got there didn't really change, didn't really move, um, didn't really have any parts. I, I got bored very quickly, to be honest. And it was full of the country cliche as well, which is a shame because, you know, this guy can obviously play guitar. He's obviously got the ability to write and lay down a track. He's got an idea of what he's doing. But this song, to me, was, was definitely the wrong one to do. Stick with the guitar playing. That is where the strength is here. And, um, you know work on the vocals as well all right i appreciate that thank you very much ian gentlemen let me introduce the artist of that track to you that track is called beyond the forest by dennis james dennis james of beyond the forest thank you dennis for sending that in to music scene investigation I want to also thank everybody over at compose.com those are the guys who uh, have a lot of musicians over there if you're looking for collaborators you need a bass player or a drummer 
head to combos.com. Those guys have been very kind in pointing musicians over our way, and we appreciate that. And hopefully we've uh, offered them some good advice over the last year or so as well. So uh, do yourself a favor if you're looking for a uh, collaborator. Compose.com is the place to go. Now, uh, guys, uh, we do have one more. I know you're ready for it. Uh, so I guess hold on to your hats because uh, song number three is on its way. I'm holding on to mine. And song number three on today's MSI. There you have it. Now let's go straight to Paul Miro, our guest panelist. Find out what he thought. Paul? Do you know what? I had this, I had a wonderful, uh, when that song started and the guy's voice dropped in or, or Dr. John and kind of Springsteen on really bad day, I thought this is going to be awesome. The band are fantastic. It's kind of, it, it, for me it was evocative of... Um, Things like early, you know, Clapton around uh, the Ocean Boulevard sort of period. Really, really nice sort of laid back feel. The drummer's great. Um, musically, I had no problem. I even like the sax solo. And I mean, you know, I always say 
never have an instrument on that can be fit up, up your backside unless it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> that was that was all really, really great. I really like the guy's voice. Like I say that Dr. John thing, and there's always sort of a Van Morrison y thing going on there. What what killed it for me is I don't like the chorus. Um, lyrically, I just it's it became I don't know it, it almost it's it seemed a bit cheesy. The chorus lyrically, show me your colours. I don't know whether it was a uh, for a football team or whether it was for a I, I don't know. That's what it left me feeling. And the whole thing of painted this picture of kind of your sort of derelict guys, the almost New Orleans thing, and it was really really great vibe. But the chorus seemed out of place lyrically everything else i really liked all right paul i appreciate that and ian what do you think of uh track number three and he is holding on to his hat just, mm -hmm. just as, yeah you can buy these at the msi website if you want to what, what does it say on it there it says msi look uh, i got yeah, no video yeah. so i can't see there you, you go you so, don't have video no no my skype flipped uh, out about 20 minutes ago and i just got me well, I'll send you video back then. Sorry okay, oh, there we go. Yeah, I can see the hat now. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so uh, your so, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, as, as Paul said, again, I mean, the band on this were fantastic. I really, really did like the instrumentation. It was brilliant. I found the drums were a tad prominent. Um, mm. I love the sax solo, personally. I really do like uh, a good sax yeah. solo, a good bit of sax. You can't beat it. Um, it was tasteful and it worked for me and I liked the way they sort of interspersed out with the electric guitar lead um, in the break after that so overall the, the backing track was good again the guy's vocal I liked it it had character it did have that Dr. John Van Morrison I was trying to think uh, of artists he, he reminded me of and Dr. John was hit on the head and also um, Dr. Mayhem no Dr. Dr. T yeah. and the electric oh, no, mayhem yeah, from the Muppets yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about the Muppets in the chat room today, um, and this definitely had a, do a Dr. Dr. Teeth feel about it. Um, it was, uh, again, I wanted to like it. I wanted to like it as a song, and, and something wasn't working for me. It was a tad cliche on that chorus. Um, everything's there. It just didn't pull me in as well as I hoped it would. Again, the intro was like, oh, this is nice. A bit more country, maybe, but, you know, so I, I'm on the fence with this. The mix, the instrumentation, fantastic. The song overall, not too sure about. All right. I appreciate that, Ian. Tom, uh, your thoughts on this one? Well, first, I thought it was Ian's two favorite things, country music and a fade-out. <laughs> oh, yeah, it had a fade-out on it as well. And that was the other thing. That just reminded me, Tom. It had a fade-out on it. Not only did it have a fade-out on it, but it brought in these weirdly timed heavy guitars which hadn't appeared in the whole of the song and just appeared for this fade-out. Oh, we, we, we we're here, boys. We made it in time. Oh, we're just fading out. All right. Gink, gink. Uh, <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> Rant over. Go on, Tom. I will. Rich, you're taking me off. I didn't do it. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> what, what do you think? What do I think? Um... I like the character of the guy's voice. He's got to work on his enunciation because I could barely mm -hmm. understand him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the emotion is there and it's, it's all performance, but um, if they can't understand the lyrics, you lose, you know, 75% of the interest in the song. And I don't think um, it carried the song well. It's it, 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 like Paul said, you know, Dr. John, Springsteen, Van Morrison on a bad day. Um, sax solo was okay, a little distant sounding. Um, Song-wise, the structure was fine. I was fine with it. Again, it started off nice and went nowhere. Um, and the chorus was not hooky enough. Um, it, it, it definitely needs some work on it. The musicianship is definitely there, you know, and uh, the recording, you know, I could live with it as a demo. 
know, um, but personally, you know, I'm I'm not much of a, a country western fan or country music unless it's very well done, you know, and and mm -hmm. this wasn't so. Um, I, I have to just say keep working on it and 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 watch your pronunciation, you know, and and bring your own mic because nobody else is going to use it after you. <laughs> okay. get, get some get some vocal zone. They're great for doing that sort of thing. They're herbal sort of things you can take and they soothe your voice. Brilliant. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, let me introduce that song to everybody. The uh, track itself is called Show Your Colors. That's right. Show Your Colors by Bourbon. Get this. The Master of Disaster. So, Bourbon, thank you for sending that track in to Music Scene Investigation. Hang about. He wins just for having the name of Bourbon. Sorry. Bourbon and Master <laughs> of Disaster. Don't forget that part. <laughs> it's <laughs> true. Our first album's a double. <laughs> 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 All right, gentlemen, uh, it's time to throw it over to you and let you decide on the uh, song of the week this week. So I leave it in your hands. Do you know what? I'm going to jump I'll... straight in here. No, I'm, oh, I am. Go I'm going. My you're, turn. You're, <laughs> you're, no, no, Ian, really, go. I, I think you That's, should all can I go? talk at the same time. You, you, you go, Ian, really. I, I reckon I'm going to give it a I shot. I really, uh, really think you should go. First of all, I second yeah, try. Really I really let my hat in it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let me step in here. Ian, go ahead. Right, first of all, try those right. My hat should win. Um, my hat should be song of the week this week. But if not, I'm going to go for number one. Now, that's probably might sound a little right. choice. It's, it's the less produced, but it is the better song, song, and I liked it's it, best and best. it needs a lot of work, but it is the, definitely it's the best song. All right. You can see here on my, uh, my notes, I don't know if you can read those from there, but just to show this isn't fixed, I've got a, a big number one there as my, um, my winning thing. So um, there you go. Number one was for me as well. Okay, and Tom? Personally, it's I'd rather shoot myself and everybody count. else in the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't do that, Tom, unfortunately, so you need to have a song choice here. Okay. Then, why rock the boat? Because it's filled with these people who sing and send us music. I don't want to go overboard because they'll tear me apart. Um, <laughs> I'll go with number one because it is the better song. It's the least produced, the, the most unprofessionally recorded. And as for my opinion for all three songs, I don't think none of them, any of them rather, should uh, make it to MSI Radio, I'm sorry to say. Um, the, all three of them, you know, need lots of work. Um, clarifications, unifications, recording tweaks, and 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 production uh, techniques. So um, even though I'm voting for number one, it's uh, with notice. Okay, I appreciate that, uh, gentlemen. Your duties here are finished. Song number one, Hard Rock and Rob's been uh, one of those days. Is our song of the week this week. Uh, and uh, Ian, Paul, uh, your thoughts the same as Tom's on uh, radio play for these two on MSI Radio? I don't know your criteria for playing. I mean, I always look at things. Um, I never look at anything more than being demos when I come on this show because that's, to be fair, that is all I've heard. Right. But there are different degrees of, of demos. And um, tonight, there's been there's definitely been a country flavor tonight, um, which is sure a coincidence but definitely ironically <laughs> I, I, yeah ironically i think um the fact that we've all gone for song one because the song is the best if we are here to be listening to songs and advise on how they can be better then you know i'm not i'm, I'm not disagreeing with tommy because obviously we want to hear things that are put together better but We've been in a position tonight where the first track, I didn't think that that was going to win by a long shot, you know, on first hearing it. I was there thinking, well, okay, that's going to be third tonight, you know, good effort, lads, but you need to try harder. 
those guys have gone away and won tonight because they've got a better song than the other two songs were on and they've now got the opportunity to go away and do some learning and try and think about arrangement and rehearsing more and uh, putting it together in the studio in a more professional manner so from that point of view surely that's that's a positive so then you know I mean it's not going to get radio play but I don't think a lot of things on uh, general radio play are going to get that via this medium. This is a medium where we're trying to advise people, if correct me if I'm wrong, on how to put things together in order to get more radio play. Absolutely. You know? uh, Absolutely. So from that point of view, I think then it's been a, a fairly constructive evening. I agree with you. I definitely agree. Ian, uh, I assume you're thinking the same thing. Well, ironically, I'm going to say I don't think number one should be on the radio station. As much as it is Song of the Week, as much as it's a good song, it's not radio ready for certain. Uh, mm. I'm not too keen on having number two on the radio station. But I would say number three would probably work on MSI Radio. And the reason I say that is because the instrumentation is good, the mix is generally good, the production is pretty good. Yeah, it's got its flaws, but you know, there's going to be a market out there. Someone out there is going to like that song, even if we don't. All right, but well, that makes sense. That really does. Uh, gentlemen, as always, thank you all for your, uh, your, uh, your, your jobs well done on the panel, obviously. And Paul? Uh, <laughs> do you know what we do, Rich? <laughs> yeah, of course I do, Tom. It just takes me a while to get it out sometimes. Paul, I want to thank you very much for joining us, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know uh, uh, spending up 20 hours a day in the studio has just got to be killer on you, so uh, we appreciate you taking a little time away from that. My pleasure. It's been a, a nice, relaxing hour and a half. Um, I'm going to go drink copious amounts of wine to knock myself out this evening. Well, there you go. Good Enjoy. man, good man. I wish I could be there and join you. There you have it. There's not enough wine for two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm raising a There's glass never, of gentleman Jack G now. There's never enough wine for two. <laughs> well, there you have it, everybody. Thank Tommy you. Can wine for two. That's it. Now, thank you for being with us on this week's episode of Music Scene Investigation. Now, before Ian flaps his arms at me, I'm going to throw it over to him so he can tell you who's on next week. It's a surprise. Well, we have a surprise this time, huh? So, in other yep. words, you don't know. It's a surprise. That's, now, what, that's all I'm going to say. All right. Well, I, 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 in all seriousness, I, I have actually asked someone to, to do this date. And I'm still waiting to hear, unfortunately. But if I get them, it'll be a bit of a surprise. Okay, well, we're looking forward to that. Hope you join us again next week, everybody. want to remind you, if you want to see the show recorded live, uh, join us on Music Scene Investigation at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Sundays. That's 9 p.m. GMT. And also join us on MSI Radio every uh, weekend for Music Scene Investigation, as well as every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern for Indie Inquest. Uh, that's a show that we do, which brings you all the indie news and everything you ever wanted to know about everything else as well. So we're going to play out on Hard Rock and Rob's song. Uh, been one of those days right here on MSI as we leave you this week. Enjoy, everyone. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.
try to see your face Through a haze I can't replace all that love